where it's headed to an empire and a turning to a man to reestablish order, put all power in the hands of one person, uh, really is triggered by a lack of self-government, a lack of character among the Romans, so that now they need a harsher and harsher rule to maintain order. So uh, when you're lacking order, uh, people want to have peace reestablished. They are willing, uh, we see in history, to vote in a tyrant. And they do it over and over and over again to their woe. But the tyrant restores order at great cost of their personal liberty. So they lose liberty to gain order. So we start to see Gaius, uh, Gracchus, who because of uh, this, this uh, terrible situation, uh, inflation, uh, people starving, uh, the, the poor people, the common people being taken advantage of, he steps in, the Senate tries to kill him, and he uh, uh, promotes uh, common people, but he kind of does it heavy-handed. He's uh, looked at sort of as a savior. He's a man of the common people. Then we see Rome's uh, armies lose uh, the fight in uh, several theaters. Two, two armies are defeated. And Marius, who is uh, one of the consuls, is uh, deciding, well, to solve that problem, we need a professional army. Of course, that means that the generals now are going to control the armies, and the armies can, come, can become corrupt. So Sulla, who is the general of the Senate, and Marius, who's the general of the General Assembly, uh, they uh, initiate civil war. And of course, Sulla wins the civil war. Marius is defeated, and Sulla is made dictator then. The Senate uh, puts him as dictator, and he exceeds what he's supposed to do. He keeps control for six times the time that he was supposed to. So for three years, he uh, steps up. But what's happening now is they're seeing the Romans are looking to men to solve their problem. And uh, they're going to lose their liberty as they look to men. Because men are selfish and they are uh, ambitious and they will take advantage of situations to gain more power. We then have the first triumvirate which is Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Crassius. So we have the first triumvirate. They rule over Rome. Now here you have a group of men who are really ruling. And uh, so the Romans, even further now, drawn into their uh, need for a heavy-handed ruler, a, uh, someone to establish order. And Caesar... Uh, gets more and more powerful, and the, then the people are more and more willing to have one man become a dictator, which he does. He becomes dictator after being very popular as a proconsul of Gaul for 10 years. He now becomes dictator, and he uh, crosses the Rubicon to establish order and to defeat Pompey in 49 B.C., and he declares himself dictator for life. And in 44 BC, people who are worried about him assassinate him. And that initiates another civil war. And so now you have the conspirators led by Brutus and Crassus versus the, the friends of Caesar, Caesar's nephew, Octavius who is his adopted son, and Lepidus, a general, and Antony, Caesar's close friend. And they defeat 
the uh, conspirators, and then one by one they fall. Uh, Rome is plunged into a second civil war, and uh, with the Battle of Actium, actually, you know, this is the second civil war, actually, with the conspirators, but then uh, with the Battle of Actium, one of these three now emerges as ruler, and that is Octavius. And he becomes the uh, Caesar Augustus. So you see, tracing it from Gaius Gracchus to Marius versus Sulla, here's the first civil war. And then a dictator, Sulla, is chosen, and they have the first triumvirate, Caesar, uh, Octavius, and uh, I'm sorry, Caesar, uh, Crassus, and uh, Pompey. And then from that, Caesar becomes the, the lead dictator after fighting and winning against Pompey, proclaims himself dictator, and then he in turn is assassinated. So uh, finally, through more war, Octavius emerges as Caesar Augustus. So... The results, some of the results that we see here. We see that violence begets violence, doesn't it? You can see where Jesus uh, was completely right in saying that he who takes up the sword will die by the sword. Violence begets violence. Uh, we see that uh, one, uh, the, and, and that the people are willing to have a, a tyrant for order. They will exchange liberty for order. We see that very clearly. We see that the, the, the nature of man, we see it over and over and over, what men will go to great lengths, will try to achieve power, and um, fame. And so we see that one of the lessons is that you never see, you never see a benevolent dictator. Every dictator is one who will not relinquish their power and uh, dictatorship uh, just is not a um, solution. It'd be like saying um, if we had a great depression and a lot of unemployment that, oh, well, we'll just let the government um, employ more people. And we'll just let the government take more tax money and distribute that to more people so the government will solve the problem. Well, we know that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is in the heart of man. The problem is selfishness or laziness and a lack of, of uh, caring. And so people um, are, uh, are, are not using their, their wealth to help others. They use it in selfish ways. So a dictatorship is not going to solve the problem, just like uh, the government spending a load of money to stimulate the economy is not going to solve the problem either. It's very short term will solve the problem, but long term it'll hurt the, the nation or hurt the empire. A dictatorship just results in the people becoming used to uh, someone getting them out of the problem and not themselves. So that people are becoming lazy and there's a lack of self-government. So uh, the things that will benefit the nation are not being done. And uh, so uh, a heavy-handed ruler is not a, a long-term solution. So we see that over and over and over again. And in fact, I think if you were one of our founding fathers, studying this situation. If you were James Madison 
or George Washington, and you're at the Constitutional Convention thinking of a government for our nation, uh, you would not want a dictatorship. You would want to put checks and balances in place and divide power to make it hard for it to be accumulated into one person. It makes it hard. It's hard to have a dictator. It's hard to have a tyrant seize control. Power is divided. So, following the uh, Julio-Claudian emperors, we, uh, uh, in other words, following Nero, we have the Flavian uh, emperors. And uh, the first one um, is number six, the sixth emperor, Vespasian. Now, Vespasian is an interesting uh, uh, emperor. He's the first emperor who is not a patrician. In fact, he was chosen uh, for his skill and not that he was uh, related to Nero. And he was uh, uh, from Spain, so he was not even Roman. Oops writing the wrong thing here. He's from Spain. So Vespasian is one who, during his reign, made a lot of real good choices, and uh, he extended the Latin rite, this idea that you could have some of the privileges of citizenship. He extended it from the Italian peninsula uh, to include Spain. And so now uh, the Roman Empire is becoming more open to extending citizenship. He was uh, followed by the seventh, um, his son, the seventh emperor, Titus. Now Titus was the one who had uh, been at uh, uh, Jerusalem and was at the siege of Jerusalem. And so he suffered, uh, when he became uh, emperor, he was only uh, emperor for about two years, but during that time uh, had suffered from a plague that hit Rome, and uh, also uh, Vesuvius, Mount Vesuvius, uh, near Pompey, buried Pompey in a, a volcanic eruption. So it's not Pompey, it's Pompeii. Let me see if I can spell that. That's not the way to spell it. Pompeii, here we go. So it buried Pompeii, and this was one of the big catastrophes of the time. So it seems that he brought catastrophe upon God's people, the Jews, in Jerusalem and tore the temple down. And then he suffered catastrophe during his reign. I think the two are related, in my opinion. Uh, Domitian was another son of uh, Vespasian. And Domitian launched a uh, persecution. This was one of the biggest persecutions uh, of the Jews and of the Christians because neither one would bow the knee to a Roman ruler. And uh, so this is uh, one where he actually tried to, to hunt down all the copies of Scripture and destroy them and fortunately was not able to. But he, uh, this was one of the, the, the bigger, harder persecutions. And he dies in 96 A.D. So 96 A.D., Domitian dies. And I think the, the major thing that we can remember there is this persecution. Now following 
uh, Domitian were five good emperors. And so if you can remember the Flavian emperors, Vespasian, uh, Titus, and Domitian, okay? So three Flavian Empire, uh, emperors. Now we have the five good emperors. And, and there was kind of a string of good emperors uh, following Domitian. The first one, uh, number nine, emperor, emperor number nine, um, was, uh, let me redo that so I can just, yeah, number nine was Nerva. Nerva was a, uh, an appointment by the Senate. So the Senate actually appointed he, uh, him to the throne, and he uh, selected the new emperor after him. So they, they got to the place now where the emperors were seeing wisdom in selecting their successor. And, uh, and with Nerva, uh, this was the first one who did that. Nerva selected Trajan. Now Trajan I can spell Trajan, T-R, there you go. Trajan was a great general, and during his rule, uh, he saw the boundaries of the empire reach the greatest extent. And so uh, the Romans pushed north into Scotland, they pushed uh, across the Rhine River into Germany. They, they pushed north of uh, Bulgaria uh, and Romania into an area called Dacia. They, uh, in other words, they broadened their extent to the greatest limit. And so uh, Trajan is, um, you know, the, the, they were the most legions, the most manpower. Uh, the Roman Empire is... Uh, is, is uh, the conquest is the greatest during his time. And Hadrian was the emperor who followed him. Hadrian actually decided to pull back uh, the borders uh, to some more defensible areas. And he, for instance, uh, built a couple different walls. Uh, the famous one is across England. It's called Hadrian's Wall, and it's real uh, close, just south of Scotland. It's on the Scottish border with England. And uh, so this, this big wall that he built. So he was finding, uh, he was looking strategically, you know, how do we stabilize the edges of the Roman Empire? He was followed by an Antonius Pius, and Antonius Pius uh, had a very interesting, I think I misspelled Pius, excuse me that, P, I think it's P-I-U-S, there you go. Antonius Pius had a time where there were no disasters during his reign, and he was a very wealthy successful emperor, and so he even refused salary. And he used his own funds to pay uh, a number of projects that he supported. So a very uh, beneficent uh, emperor. And then he's followed by our last of the five good emperors, Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius. Uh, a number of years ago, I taught a college class in ancient history, and we were taking time to study each of these emperors. And one of the students, uh, one of my best students I've ever had, decided to do a paper on Marcus Aurelius. Each of the students did a different emperor. And this lady was very, very intrigued with Aurelius, and one of the reasons uh, that he is uh, so well known 
is that he was a poet and a writer. In fact, he devoted himself to Stoic philosophy, and he wrote, uh, let me write that down, he was a Stoic. Now, a Stoic means that you show very little emotion, uh, life is uh, kind of to be faced uh, as, a, you know, in a very uh, logical, rational way. And so it's a philosophy of, of, uh, of acceptance of things that, that are. And he wrote a uh, real interesting uh, book. In fact, I think it's the only book that any of the emperors wrote that still exists. He wrote The Meditations. You can get this. In fact, we have it uh, in our library, The Meditations. And uh, it's 12 books of uh, his philosophy where he's thinking and he's reflecting uh, the, the meditation. So it's pretty famous. Now he's the last of the five good emperors. And he was um, uh, from a Spanish family. I'm going to talk a little bit about him because he's an interesting emperor. He was favored by Hadrian and he was adopted by Antonius Pius. So that's how often uh, these the next emperor was chosen. He was chosen, but then he was adopted into the family of uh, the emperor. And that's what happened here. Antonius Pius adopted him. He uh, was crowned emperor in 161 uh, AD. He ruled with his adopted brother until uh, 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 169. So he was uh, a co-ruler with his adopted brother. Now he fought to maintain the German tribes. So he maintained uh, the kind of this standoff with the Germans. The Germans wanted to come across the border into the empire and he positioned the legions just to keep them out. So uh, I'm going to put down the German tribes. You know what I mean. You're talking about the barbarians that want to come across and come into the empire. He wanted also to improve the poor uh, living situation. Um, and uh, he, he worked hard uh, on doing that. He, he wanted to improve their situation. He donated, uh, as an example, eight pieces of gold to every citizen. And the symbol for gold is AU. Let's see if we can make that a little clearer. AU to each person, uh, each citizen. I can get that looking better too. And um, he martyred Christians until toward the end of his reign where he tried to lessen the gladiator fight. So I'm going to put down here towards the end of his reign he lessened the gladiator fights. And uh, so you see that he was uh, kind of a reformer. He, he was thoughtful and he uh, saw areas that he could improve. And so they often um, called him the philosopher king. He was the philosopher king. Now his son, Commodus, was a very corrupt emperor. So um, it, this is where uh, this breaks down. And you, you really see just uh, worse and worse emperors following these five good emperors. <laughs>